Hello and welcome to the Active Atom Educational Series. My name is Lance. And my name's Patrick. And we are going to cover precision spindle rebuilding. And we're particularly, we're going to cover the Levin and Son Company's machinery and accessory spindle rebuilding. That's correct. But not exclusively to, to Levin. These spindle rebuilding procedures are applicable to most all spindle rebuilding. That's right, because a lot of our viewers may not have a Levin machine, and that's perfectly fine. Hey, you know, what's that name I can't ever say that I love the company, though? Oh, Scoblin. Scoblin. Yes. That's it, yeah. But yeah, a lot of these precision machines, they use the same type of bearings that the Levin uses. So a lot of the procedures we're going to be covering can definitely be applied to other machines. Yeah, procedures, processes, ethics, the whole thing. Tools right? and, and supplies, so forth. It's just our way of thinking. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I see you have, like... A lot of different, these are all 11, I think they are. Yes. They all look a little bit different. Do you want to share what we're going to cover? Yes. Um, oh, it's a multi-part series, huh? It is. It's going to be five parts. And uh, what you see up here is we have three 11 headstocks. We have two closed style 11 headstocks here, a 3C collet and a D collet. Okay, we also have another D collet headstock, which is referred to as an open style headstock. And the reason why it's open style is because, as you can see, the, the belt pulley usually gets installed in the center and everything's exposed. I like that old school one. Yeah, it's definitely old school. Yeah. Yeah. And then over here, we have what's called the Levin Accessory Spindle. And it's a little tiny spindle that's used on Levin's uh, milling attachment, grinding attachment, micro drilling attachment. Oh, yeah, it's so really forth. neat. So they use this little spindle a lot in a lot of their accessories. And what Lance is going to show you is we actually have an assembled one. And the reason why we have an assembled one is because, unfortunately, we had disassembled all these other spindles prior to ever thinking about doing a video. So we kept this one because we wanted to show you guys how we disassemble a spindle. So And this one's bad. So. It that's right, this is a bad spindle. It just happens to be a backup or secondary one. That's and right. So so we don't know what's inside yet. And these, we, we didn't know what was inside either, but we wanted to do this series in a reasonable amount of time. And we started months ago taking these apart, right. testing, re, repainting them, procuring the parts, machining some parts, creating other parts and traveling the planet looking for the, for more parts and then from 11 we got more parts than that so right because we didn't want to show the disassembly of these spindles and then come back and in then, six months <laughs> exactly so so that's the reason so no matter what happens with this well you're gonna you're gonna yeah let me this. go through the yeah let, uh, it, we'll, i'll explain this real quick and i'll get into the parts so one of the parts we're going to disassemble this and just to show you the procedure we take in disassembling a spindle Okay, but during the assembly process, we have the identical accessory spindle over here that's already been disassembled and it's ready to be assembled. So there's not going to be any delays in the release of the parts. And that was our fear. That was our fear. Okay, so there's going to be five parts in this series. Part one is going to be this video, which is an introduction. Okay, and the introduction is basically we're going to cover like all the tools and supplies you're going to need, so, uh, measuring instruments. Um, like and then like supplies like grease, oil, and give you a little education on the type of bearings we use, which are angler contact bearings, and and so on. We'll get into to the details. Hey, wait, can I stop right there and share something though? Oh, please do. Don't let things like the words he uses, like <laughs> angler contact bearings and all that, cause any fear with you. Listen, no. I didn't know what they were once upon a time either. So. You'll learn them. That's what we're here for. We're not here to show you how, how, how what we know. We're here to show you what, how we do things. That's right. What it is, right. Exactly. We're going to share our knowledge with you. You're in good hands. Don't yeah. worry about it. Okay. Okay. So and then okay. So the next part is part two, and part two is going to focus on the disassembly of this accessory spindle we just showed you. Okay. Part three is actually going to consist of subparts, and part and, and part three is going to focus on the assembly of these four spindles. And the reason why there's gonna be a sub part because it'll be like three, uh, part 3A that's gonna focus on this headstock. 
3B for the next, 3C, and so forth. And in the future, we may even release additional subparts. Sure. You know, if there's other spindles we come across. Okay, part four is going to focus on the break-in procedure. Because after we assemble a spindle, you can't just put it back into service. Uh, you have risks of overheating it and... And yeah, and bad things can happen. So we're gonna, and we'll we'll get into the details of that too. So part four is gonna be the break-in procedure. Okay, after that's completed successfully, we go to the last part, and that's part five. In part five, we focus on the grinding of the collet seat. Um, every spindle, obviously, all the spindles we're working with uh, take wire collets. They call them. You know, like the 3C, D, WW, like this takes WW, watchmaker collets. And every spindle has this tapered seat. It's where the collet rests, where you pull the collet and it closes. So over, over time, this taper can get worn. So, but there's two, reason, two main reasons why we have to grind this taper uh, as, as a last stage before we can put this to service. Okay, first is when we install new bearings, the axis of the spindle is going to change slightly, which means the taper isn't going to be, isn't going to be perfectly concentric anymore with the axis of the spindle. So that's why we have to grind it. But we also want to grind the taper just because over the years it gets worn, sometimes it gets damaged. Oh yeah, well you know we and and, and guys, any, anybody watching knows if you have it like an R8 call it inside of a, a mill machine, an e-mill. Yeah, you'll see it's it's got these hard what I call hard hard connect contact places on it. Yeah, and, and uh, that's what we're gonna try to re, just repair. You're just gonna just gonna re, re redefine that again and make it so that we get an even pull. Exactly. And that's all that is. Don't yeah. be, don't be fearful. No, and we're going to show you the, the entire process of doing that. Yeah. So we're going to hide anything. We're going to show everything we know. Okay. Um, I think that's up. That covers everything. Well, it would, except we got something new we've added to this video series. And it's really exciting to me. As web developers, we are able to just produce web pages, aren't we? Well, we have a yeah. library and a website, activeadam.com. Yeah. And in that library, there's going to be a special section where you can, because I know we've both done this, huh? When we watch a video, we're over here with a little notepad and we're stopping the video and we're making little oh, notes, yeah. trying to yeah, learn how to paint this it. little thing or, yeah. or just all that little thing. And, and uh, our stuff we're just not familiar with, like stuff we fix around the house and watch a video. So we've made a downloadable live document. It's called a live document for a reason, huh? Right. It's going to be a document version of the video. It is. So that way, if you want to attempt this procedure yourself, you don't have to take notes. Just just take your time, watch the video, just focus on what we're doing, and then you can go to this web page, and we're gonna have a link in the description to where this page is. Yeah, like when he does that. <laughs> yeah. And link below. And you can download it, print it, and it'll have all the details and links you need. Can we share why it's a live document? Yeah, please. Okay. It's gonna be live because this is a public video series and it's technical. That means somebody else out there might have a different approach, an idea, thought, and the comments of our videos right. where they're open, you can leave comments and we answer all of our comments anyways, everybody knows. And, and so what, what we're going to be able to do is, is if, if something valid is put there on, on how to rebuild these spindles and something we just overlooked or something, another approach, a different idea that, that's, that's, that's right. warranted, we'll right. add that to this living document on the web page immediately. That's right, because we can't, obviously, we can't keep producing uh, updates to the videos. No. You know, so. but we're, but we're going to keep this document updated at all times. So if a person comes along a year from today, it might have a whole bunch of updates that weren't here the day yeah. we released these, this series. So yeah, good That's kind of neat. Yeah. That's all I have there, right? Is that what I'm doing? Yeah, that looks good. So let's get going. Let's get at it. All I right. think we're going to enjoy ourselves. Come learn. Okay. Bye. Bye. Part 1, Section 2, Spindle Rebuilding is not for the inexperienced. Patrick, you would you like to elaborate? Sure. It's a good point because one of the things we want to stress is we know there's a lot of beginners that get into the watchmaking or machine trade. You know, maybe sometimes it's a hobby or they're actually getting into it as a career. So one of the first things they do is they buy a machine. You know, usually I uh, used one on a, one of those auction sites. You know. Sure. And that's perfectly fine 
So and that, but, that's how we started this place. That's right. You know, we never bought any new machine. We could afford anything like that. Are you right. kidding? We just bought it, hoped it worked. Right. So we completely understand buying used because you save a tremendous amount of money. And then we hoped too much and it didn't work. We had to learn how to fix it and rebuild it. That's right. That's what led us to here. And, and a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. So the reason why we mention that is because when you, when you purchase a used machine and you receive it, it's very likely that you're going to have to rebuild the spindle because a lot of these machines, they've either been, uh, you know, sitting for many years or they've been crashed and, and nobody, they, the current owner doesn't want to repair it. So it's going to need some work. So, but, so, and that's what we want to stress is we know that a lot of the beginners are probably going to be watching this video wanting, wanting to rebuild their Levin spindle. And unfortunately, we don't recommend it only because as you'll see in this video, it just takes a lot of tools, a lot of supplies. Uh, it's gonna um, a lot of really strict discipline. Yeah, a lot of strict discipline. This is not a hammer and chisel type of no. Uh, and giant presses and all that. No, 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 no. No, it's no. very intricate. A, very gentle. Yeah, and it's gonna take a, a lot of uh, measuring instruments, which we're gonna show. Yeah, real technical so, ones. Right, and, and but most important. Uh, we feel that it takes prior experience, somebody that's been in this field for a while, because most important is, after, especially for the first time, if you're following the spindle rebuild procedure, you're gonna run into problems. Yeah, if you're yeah. if you rebuilt vertical spindles on a CNC machine, and you want to take this task on, right? You, you're probably gonna figure this out. Um, this isn't sure. It's very similar. It's just small. Right. It's just small. And, and so it requires a little bit of delicacy. It's not, it's just like I say, it's not the hammer world. That's all. Right. We don't want to mislead people. And no. You know, we just we just want to help share our experience on how we approach these things. And that's one of these things. Yeah, we just want to convey that by watching this video, anybody could do it. No, you can't. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, because we don't want people, because it's going to, you know, it does take a lot of money to purchase the bearings. These bearings oh. are very expensive. So you're going to be spending you know, pretty good sum of money for the supplies. And it'd just be a shame for you to attempt this as a beginner and run into issues and you've just wasted hundreds of dollars. So- But in time, you honestly can do this. You just have definitely. to start somewhere and this may not be where you start, but but this would be where you end up, I guess, right? So That's right. Cause you know, when you get- We when did you, it. When you gain experience too, uh, and when you run into issues, which you, you, you likely are gonna run issues right. with this procedure, uh, you, you have to have the capability of diagnosing the problems and then fixing it. So yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. We just want to so, give you those warnings, and I guess we'll uh, move, keep moving along yeah. on the parts here. Yep. Okay. Part one, section three. We do not offer spindle rebuilding services or support, but here's Patrick to explain. Yeah, what we want to say is, if if you're watching this video series, and after watching it. You know, you feel you have the confidence, the experience, and all the tools that we show uh, at your disposal. By all means, you know, we don't want to discourage anybody from trying this for the first time. By all means, you know, again, if you have the confidence, we recommend that you give it a shot because we all have to do things for the first yeah, time. It's, it's not like it's not achievable. It, it's, just, it's just we don't know skill sets. That's we right. We don't know if you can, if you're dyslexic, is that it? The guy that can do left and right hands? Or dexterity. Dexterity, all that. Yeah. And, and, and we don't know if, we don't know if you could just turn, it, you're capable of putting a screw in a hole or if you're capable of, of, of five axis CNC programming. We don't know. That's right. So, so it's really up to you if you, if our, you our know. Our little disclaimers and our warnings are strictly just that. We're just trying to make sure, to, right. don't get yourself in a pickle, then contact us because it's just not going to, it's not. It's not what we're here for. We're not representing ourselves as being here to do that either. Right. Although we're sharing our knowledge on how to do this procedure, unfortunately, you know, we just don't provide this as a service by our company. No. And unfortunately, we just can't provide phone or email support. Because anyone who knows us and knows what they're doing, what we're doing on our channel, Shop Adventures, they know we're on a journey yeah. with a schedule, and we can't deviate from that schedule in making our product. So that's the only reason. We're not being mean. It's just we yeah. have to get somewhere along the way here and we're coming close so it's just the two of us that's it yeah, that's so what you see is all there is <laughs> yeah i mean there's no there's no no behind the scenes people here right okay well that's that oh but if they do have any questions after watching the video oh yeah 
do you want to? Oh, you want me to do it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you, you know, if you, we love getting comments. I, um, we've mentioned that yeah. in our regular show. So in this video series, we love the comments, especially the technical stuff. Yeah. So if, if you, you got technical stuff, you want to ask questions there in the comments publicly, fine. We'll answer any comments always as best as our abilities can allow us. Yeah, because especially public questions and comments, that can help a large group of people too. Right, that's not just so, helping you, it's like helping the community. Yeah. And we like that. Yeah. That's why we try so hard. Okay, so we just want to say that before we start, you know, continuing with right. the okay. <laughs> lessons. Thank you. Part 1, Section 4. So, Patrick, how did we learn to rebuild Levin Spindles? Good question. Well, you know what? We were really fortunate that we met a really nice guy. Um, because, you know, we used, we didn't used to do this for when we got into the Levin machinery. Oh. You know, just like everybody, so many other people, we used to send our spindles out to Levin and have them rebuild them. And this, we were talking many years ago. I mean, 50, 20 years ago? Oh. I think we sent, yeah, so we're talking years ago. And then we met, uh, we met this guy, uh, Master, he was a retired master machinist. Really nice guy. We actually purchased our Levin little drill press from him. Bill. Yeah, Bill. And Sherman Oaks, where he's located, or he was located. And really nice guy. We hit it off. You know, both Lance and I went to his place uh, to pick it up. Really nice guy. And... Well, what we thought was just going to be buying an 11 accessory or something. Right. And a long drive for people like us that never leave anywhere. Um, it turned out to be a full story. Yeah. A whole history. And some very valuable knowledge. That's right. Because he used to own a little micro machine shop, right? Yeah, I think you said he had 10 of them or so, or 15. Or so. He had a lot of yeah, them. Yeah, he had a lot. And this was prior, hey, we should make a point, this is prior CNC. Yeah, they, you he, know. That was in ba uh, Burbank, California, there that he ran that company, I guess. That's right. That's so, where the Spruce Goose was built before it was taken down to Long Beach Harbor for its maiden flight. Did That's you know right. That? There used to be a big industry in Burbank at one time. Big, big machining, manufacturing, aerospace, all the way up through the um, all the way up through the early eighties. Yeah, really something. Yeah. So because he owned a micro machine shop with so many Levin lathes and accessories, I mean, he owned everything Levin. Oh yeah. So Love and Levin. Yeah, <laughs> I think that might be where I got that slogan. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and um, but it's so nice. He actually became a mentor of ours for many years oh. and taught us so many things. And, you know, he couldn't, you know, being that he, this is the Levin uh, machines are part of his business, you know, he didn't have the luxury of sending these spindles out to Levin every time oh. they need to be rebuilt. So he actually had to teach himself how to do this. And he also had friends in the industry, you know, being a master it's a, machinist. It's a small community. We've come to learn it's a real small community. Right. No pun intended. <laughs> right. So he used to do this job himself. So when we met him, you know, he's retired. And we started talking about, you know, rebuilding spindles and he said, and he actually, he's the person that encouraged us to do this job. And because honestly, it is a little scary at first, you know, we only knew to send them out. We didn't know to really be looking in there too much. I mean, we knew a little bit about machines and I've seen spindles as I was young and aerospace and all that bigger CNC spindles and stuff, but I never, you know, I never got involved in it, you know. Right. Services come and did that. So it's and when, intimidating. And when first. we met Bill, you know, we're talking prior internet too. Oh yeah, no BBS, no forums, no internet, no That's YouTube. Right. And this is kind of a tribute to Bill, isn't it? We're yeah. doing because we can do a digital shared story on how to do this that Bill couldn't do in his time to share with others like he wanted to do. And fortunately, That's right. he, he taught us. That's right. That's pretty neat. So that's how we first got into it. You know, we're just really fortunate. We had a great mentor that just loved, he just loved machining, micro machining, yeah, and he loved his leaven equipment. He actually, when he retired, he actually still kept a little lathe and some machines and accessories in his little apartment. Yeah, he and did. And he used to machine little parts. I mean, he just, it was just a love of his life. So he, that, so that's how we, that's where we gained the initial knowledge so, and that's what we want to do is we want to share the knowledge we gained from Bill and share it with you guys. And then in addition to that, you know, just over the years, you know, we've just gotten the habit of asking questions. Oh. Like when we meet somebody that has rebuilt a spindle or they do it for a living, uh, you know, even in your even, dad's shop. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, and they, even from Levin, we've, we, we've got good relationships with, with lots of people. Oh, that's right. Dale from Levin, he shared a lot of information with us about how they rebuild space. And some nice fellow down in San Diego and all that. So right oh, around our right. Southern California, machining in the aerospace industry is a luxury to have at all these companies like uh, General Dynamics and right. Rockwell and McDonnell Douglases and all them people that that created a lot of machine shops that let us have the opportunity to learn from all these small machine jobs as well. That's been really neat. Exactly. Because I, I don't think we could have done this without Bill. No, he's the one that really pushed us and encouraged us to do it. And um, so yeah, and that and over the years, just asking questions and just by doing, you know, I'd estimate that we've done at least 18, 20, 11 spindles. I hate builds. thinking about it because it just means how long we've been around. Right, because <laughs> yeah, if you think about it, Every 11 headstock and accessory spindle that we've ever purchased automatically gets a spindle rebuild before we put it to use. We've done many of them. We've sharpened our skills over the years. We're not so afraid of them anymore. It's, no. It, it, it's like anything. We've done this a long time. We're used to it, but, yeah. but not at first. Yeah. So, okay, yeah, so that's all we want to do. We just want to share our knowledge, you know, how we gained the knowledge and share everything we've learned over the years and share it with you guys. Yeah. And hopefully we give you the confidence uh, to try to accomplish this yourself. That sounds great. No, yeah. that's right. Thank you. Part one, section five. Why or when is it that a leaven spindle needs rebuilding, Patrick? Good question. Yeah, because you obviously don't want to do this procedure just to do it. But we will, we will tell you the most common case when you do want to rebuild the leaven spindle. And unfortunately, that's usually when you purchase a used leaven spindle. Maybe it's a leaven lathe or it's an accessory. We can pretty, you can pretty much count on receiving it, filling the spindle, and it's going to be pretty obvious that's going to need to be rebuilt. How come we know that already? Because I will say, out of, <laughs> out of all the leaven spindles we've purchased, a lot, a lot, you know, all the accessories, headstocks, everything. We've only had one spindle that we didn't need to re we didn't need to rebuild, and that was actually our Levin milling attachment. And the only reason why it didn't need to be rebuilt is because we actually bought it from an auction, and it had a inspection sheet from Levin with a date indicating that Levin had just recently done a Levin rebuild in the spindle. And for some reason, it ended up at auction. Yeah, and it ended up at an auction. All fixed up, fresh and new. Yeah, I mean, the spindle was silky smooth, beautiful, and that was the only case where we did not have to rebuild the spindle from, from a used... So from what Patrick's used... saying to you is, is that it, it, it just count on that you're going to need a spindle rebuild. Yeah, because you're going to be very lucky if you get a good spindle, unfortunately. So, okay, and so, so with that said, what are the two most common problems we find? You know, why does a spindle need to be rebuilt? Uh, well, we see the two most common problems we see is the, by, by far the number one problem is you turn the spindle by hand and it feels gritty, bumpy, oh. almost like there's sand or dirt grit in there. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Hands? Well, I have. Are we built a sample to share? Do you want me to do that? Sure, yeah. Let's let's show them. That, this is pretty funny with this antenna anyway, so go ahead and I'll, I'll just lay it out. Okay, let me just do this like this for you guys here. This is that spindle that we that one we haven't disassembled yet. And why we're disassembling it's going to become real apparent in about a second here. Uh, okay. Um, watch the antenna looking piece of wire we put on here. It should be as smooth as glass and just spin with this top. You see? Yeah, I can see it really clearly. See that? See how it jumps? That's because the bearing's riding over something. Could be dried grease, could be dirt, grit. You can literally feel the ball in the racetrack. You can just feel it. Jump, yeah, plunk, just like plunk, that. Plunk, 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 plunk. The good news is, is it still turns. That's the good news of any spindle, huh, Patrick? That's a good point. Yeah. If, if this is not if this is if you ever buy one of these used in a machine or or any of these spindle types if the spindle doesn't have what i call a pulse and that's just this ability yeah. to turn if it if it doesn't have that pulse it's probably rust bonded something down that alley yeah if you're in really bad condition it it would have to be probably rust related problem and and that's going to be a 
very serious problem once you realize what's going on inside of here. Yeah. That's, there's not much hope there. But if you can give it an impulse, if the seller tells you he can spin it with reasonable freeness. Yeah. If this isn't a nice spindle right here, by the way. I hope. I wish you could feel what, what I'm trying to convey, but we hope that we've done that in this demonstration. I think demonstration. so. I could definitely see it. Okay, so that's that. So that's that's when you know you can at least buy one of these is if it's if the buyer says it's, it's our seller says it's available to spin. That's right. Uh, that's a good start, and what you do is you do is you still have to rebuild it, but it is re probably going to be rebuildable. And visually, you don't want to see a lot of surface rust, you know, on the outside. Yeah, you none. know, little little surface rust. I you, mean, you shouldn't a, be seeing any rust in these spindles, though. No oh, definitely way. on the spindle part. That's that's right. You don't yeah, want rust on the main components. That's not good. Right. Yeah, if you had some on the pulley or some op, you know, come on, okay. Sure. Got some coolant under there stuck when it went into storage, right? Because these get stored a lot. That's right, and that's actually uh, my second uh, most common problem we see, and that's after we take it apart. You know, the internals have corrosion or surface rust, especially the bearings. Usually the spindle components don't get corroded and rusted so bad. It's usually the bearings themselves. You know, you can see the ball bearings and even the raceways, they just get coated with rust and corrosion. And um, and that's a mo that's that's a second most common problem we see, yeah. and it's pretty much those two things when you purchase a use eleven spindle that we see. Okay, so that's where that's a that, that's the most common scenario why you have to rebuild eleven spindle. Okay, after that, uh, after you've owned it for many years, okay, why would you need to rebuild eleven spindle? There, there could be a lot of things. Um, you know, it could be that the spindle just doesn't feel smooth anymore. It becomes noisy. That's the other thing. It's no longer quiet. It starts making a noise, you know, when you run it. Oh, well, we've um, heard that. Yeah, we've heard it here. <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, you can, it doesn't feel tight. It feels like you could feel if you push it, you, could, you know, there's some movement in there. It means, you know, the bearings are really worn out. There's something not right. So the, I just want to give a few examples. And you can't know. have that on this kind of tolerance level. Yeah. No. There's no, there is can. no tolerance for the tolerance. That's, that's right. Right. <laughs> oh, and one important, I missed one is, uh, you know, the other indication that you can see or determine if you have good quality bearings still is the finish of the part that you're turning. Because what will happen is, you know, in a good quality rebuilt headstock or a brand new headstock, when you turn a part, you'll get a nice finish. That's a good point. We've you always know? squeezed squeezed just one more little job off of there before we realize right. you just gotta do a rebuild. That's right. You'll suddenly see, you know, why am I you'll be asking your you'll be asking yourself, why am I not getting good finishes anymore? It's just progressively you know? and ever so slightly getting worse by the job. It's right. like it's not your cutter grinding in your exactly. and your feet thing. No. Okay. So okay. I think that about covers that. Okay. Part one, section six. What is the accuracy of 11 spindle, Patrick? Well, you know, if you buy a brand new spindle from the factory, 11 guarantees it to be within 50 millionths of an inch total indicator run out. Okay, for our metric friends, that's a slightly over one micron. Wow, wee, that's <laughs> fabulous. That's just amazingly <laughs> great American made tolerance now. It is that, impressive. Can, can I expect that on these spindles here, these rebuilds? Well, I think that's something you should shoot for, you know. But we, we, we can't determine that until... Actually, it's really hard to determine until we disassemble the spindle, uh, clean all the parts thoroughly to where they're immaculate, and then there's certain parameters we want to look for, okay? Um, what we look for, the first thing we check is we check for wear. You know, is there any wear on any of the parts? Uh, second thing is damage. You know, a lot of damage we see, unfortunately, is not from the use of the spindle. It's from prior users uh, using the incorrect tools to disassemble it or attempt to disassemble a spindle. Oh, it's a train wreck. Oh, and it's really sad. And we see a lot of really bad damage. From it, it creates most of our rework. It really does. It does. Okay, and then the third parameter is actually the spindle part itself. 
And that actually contributes the most to the end result. Well, that's one giant yeah. spindle right there. Yeah, this spindle is actually for 11 accessory spindle. It's actually the smallest spindle they make. And what we need to do is we actually need to check the condition, or not the, yeah, actually the condition by measuring it. Yeah. You know, do we have any uh, accuracy issues with th this part? Because what we need to determine is, you know, did a prior user abuse this? And is this slight, did it slightly bend? You know, because if we're starting off with a bent spindle, that's obviously not going to give you good results. Has it, has it experienced rebuild. any trauma or anything? Right, yeah. any trauma, you know, was it dropped? You know, a lot of things can happen. So, and you know, and, and you're going to have to, you know, if you find these type of issues, you're going to have to make really important You have a couple decisions. of choices to make right there. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, one of the one of the options you have is you can still buy these replacement spindles from Levin. You know, Levin's still in business and they still they still sell these parts. So that's a good thing. It's not a real low cost solution. No, they aren't cheap. But that's for sure. It is still available. Now the other thing I can do, right, is I can um I can have that hard chromed and reground. Right, that, and to that, bring up my diameters or, or anything like that, refinish my surfaces. Especially like if the bearings fit loosely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe they, maybe uh, it's been rebuilt too many times, and you know the bearings just don't fit tight any longer. Yeah, that probably be a good solution. Would be to get it hard chromed and, and reground. Ground, yeah, and, that, and that's, those yeah. are just options you have. Yeah, so there are several options, but see, those, those are decisions you're gonna have to make if you do see like wear on the parts, damage, you know. Uh, poor measurements on the spindle part, you know, because that, that's all going to influence the end result of the spindle rebuild, you know. So it's really hard to determine, you know, but you, but you want to strive. You always want to strive for the best outcome. Yeah. Definitely. Part 1, Section 7. What are angler contact bearings? Well, I can tell you this much. Angler contact bearings come in every spindle 11 builds. That's true. And earlier, if you've been paying attention, we uh, mentioned don't be afraid of a word called angler contact bearings. You know, it can sound intimidating. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I don't know that, I'm not going to watch. Nah, don't. It, I told you to be comfortable. Well, now we're going to dive into the details that make an angler contact bearing so important and what pivotal role they likely are playing in getting achieving the high tolerances Levin's able to produce. Patrick? Sure. Okay, the best way to give you a little introduction on what an angler contact bearing is, is to compare it to your common deep groove bearing. So I have an illustration here. Let's take a look at this. Okay, if we first take a look at the illustration on the left, this represents your common deep groove bearing. And what we're seeing here is we're looking at the ball bearing, one of the ball bearings inside the bearing. We have the internal raceway and we have the external raceway. And if we look here, if we look at the contact area of the bearing against the two raceways, you'll notice it's perfectly straight up and down. And what the benefit that gives a deep groove bearing is that it allows for a heavy load, or they call it a radial load, to be placed on top of the bearing this way. But though it has a weakness though. The, the, weak, the design weakness means it can't take a heavy axial load. Okay, the axial load is a load along its axis this way. Oh, well that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and see that's where the angular contact bearing comes into play. If you notice, the raceways are designed a little differently. So this is, again, this is your ball bearing, your external and your internal raceway. Okay. But see in this case, if you look at the contact area of the ball bearing against the raceways, it's now in an angle. And the benefit that gives us is this bearing is designed for both a radial load and an axial load. So, and, and the other thing is, you can also buy these bearings in different angles. But, oh. do, but you got to keep in mind, you know, you may think, oh, I'll purchase a bearing with a greater angle, but, and I'll give you greater load on the or greater axial load, but it will reduce your radial load. So that's something to keep in mind. So and you're trying to get a happy medium. Yeah, you're going to get a happy medium. 
and the happy medium and it really depends on your application and we're going to describe that further in the video on what we recommend for the eleven spindles so okay the other thing the last thing i want to discuss is preload when you use angular contact bearings you always use them in pairs so you would have two so if this was an angular contact bearing you would have two of them and they're generally used together and they're usually preloaded either on the internal race or on the external race. In the Levin's case, you know, these are installed on the spindle, two of them together, and then the preload is done with a spindle nut on the internal raceway or the race. And the reason why you want to put a preload is because it tightens a bearing so there's no play, because in a precision spindle, you do not want any play whatsoever. And if we go to the deep groove bearing, okay, it, it, you can preload it, but it's not really, again, this bearing's not made to place a heavy axle load along its axis. So preloading of a deep groove bearing is mainly done to reduce noise. Like if for a motor application, your motor's making a lot of noise, a lot of designers will add a slight preload on the bearing so the balls aren't loose. But it's not really done, it's not done for the same purpose that you do it for the angular contact bearing. So something to keep in mind. Okay, that's not to say that a lot of cheap lathe manufacturers and even milling machine manufacturers use deep groove bearings and they'll put a big preload on them. But you're really not supposed to do that. The deep groove bearings are not designed to put a big preload. And they aren't really designed for use on a, on a machine spindle. Oh, that's good information. Yeah. So I hope that really clarifies the difference between a deep groove and angular contact bearing. Yeah, see, those angular contact bearings aren't so scary after all. Yeah, they aren't, they aren't really that intimidating. They only sound intimidating. You got a little <laughs> to learn, but nothing, nothing to fear. Yeah. Okay. All right. Part 1, Section 8. Which angular contact bearings do we purchase, Patrick? Well, before we get into the details of the bearings, let's take a look at some of the part drawings for the Levin headstock and the Levin accessory spindle. So before we focus on the bearing options, let's take a look at a parts diagram from Levin. What we're looking at is, this is a parts diagram for a Levin 3C closed style headstock. But that's fine because the bearing arrangement you see right here actually applies to all Levin headstocks, closed or open style. Oh, even new and old then. That's right, from the very first their very first open style headstock bearing type that is because they did make cone style bearings but um all their ball bearing headstocks use this arrangement so good point it must be a pretty successful build then it must work really well i would hope so <laughs> no it does from our experience now we really love our 11 equipment so um yeah so what i want to show you was Okay, if we take a look at this diagram, okay, we notice we got the main spindle here, okay, and then up front, we have two angular contact bearings, or a matched pair. In the rear of the spindle, we have a single deep groove bearing. And because of the length of the spindle, we need some type of support. For that reason, though, is when you order this deep groove bearing, we have to ensure that the precision of this bearing matches the precision of the angular contact bearings. So, you know, you can't just go and buy a skateboard type deep groove bearing. You know, it's, it has to be the same precision and the same parameter. Like, can't, it can't be a metal cage bearing. It has to match uh, these, oh. which is going to be a phenolic cage bearing. Okay. So very important. And we're going to get into those details uh, very shortly. So now that gives you an idea, you know, what the inside of 11 headstock looks like. Let's focus on our first option. Okay, the next thing we want to focus on is bearing arrangement. Okay. When you, and we'll get into it in a little bit, but when you purchase these bearings, in some cases you can specify the bearing arrangement. And what that means is, when you use angular contact bearings, you're going to always use them in matched pairs, just like this. So this represents two bearings. And what this rep represents is, is this represents a back-to-back -back configuration 
a front to front and tandem. Now, if we take a look at the top, okay, just like the prior diagram or illustration, you can see the external race, the ball bearing, and the internal race. Okay, but pay attention to the angle of the two bearings. Okay, if you notice, uh, we're looking at the back-to-back -back configuration. So what we have is the inside angles on the top of the race and the outside angles on the outside of the race. So it's like this. So in this, if you think about it, if we're gonna apply preload to these bearings, we wanna provide the preload. It only makes sense to put the preload on the internal angle sure I, you know where the outside angle is because it's not going to do anything we apply the preload on the internal angle it's not really going to do anything so we always want to apply it to the outside angle okay so in this back-to-back -back configuration that means in the case of leaven okay like here i this is the spindle for leaven's accessory spindle and so what we do is we would put our angler contact bearings on two of them and then we use a spindle nut to apply the preload and that's why they use a back-to-back -back because they use a spindle nut if we look at the next illustration the front to front okay, you'll see the angles have switched you'll now see the outside angles on the top races okay in that case you would have to apply the preload on the outside races. Okay, and then what we have here, you'll notice that the angles are the same. Okay, this is what's referred to as your tandem configuration or arrangement. In this scenario, you wouldn't use this scenario alone. You would typically use this with multiple sets. So this would, like for example, this would be at one end of the spindle. Yeah, and, and there might be a distance with a big spacer in there. That's I've seen right. a lot of those. Exactly. You would have a space separated by a spacer, and then you'd have two additional of these bearings, but they'd be both facing at the opposite angle. Yeah, and then the nuts, then the, then the, then then the, the pressure comes. Then your preload comes, correct. So once again, for all the 11 headstocks and all their, and their accessory spindle, we use this configuration, which is your back-to-back, -back. okay? Okay, now let's get into the bearing options. What I've done is I've printed the bearing, uh, the, the part number ordering sheets, okay. and I have one for Barden. Let's see if I can get in the camera. Okay, so this one on the left is from Barden. And this one on the right is from SKF. And I thought that'd be a good idea as, as we're talking about the different options, we'll look at the two bearing manufacturers to get an idea of what, what's available from these manufacturers. Because these are, uh, we actually highly recommend Bard and, and SKF. Very good bearings. Okay, let's talk about what they refer to as duplex pairs or matched pairs. When you start looking for angler contact bearings, you're gonna see that term used a lot. And what they mean by that is, typically when you're searching for angler contact bearings, you're gonna notice that they're sold in pairs. So when you see the pricing on these bearings, okay, they're gonna be expensive, but you gotta realize if it's a matte pair or a matte set, it means it comes with two bearings. So it's not individual. And the reason why you buy, wanna buy them in a matte pair is because, let me show you ex some examples. These are different sizes, but these are all uh, matte paired bearing sets that were purchased in pairs, just as you see them right here. And if you'll notice, let's see if I can get it. Okay, these are the tolerance readings on each bearing. You'll usually see two readings. You'll see negative four, negative three, four, three, here you'll see two, 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 two. You'll see negative two, negative three, negative two, negative three. Notice something between these three sets. The tolerance of each bearing in the set is identical. That's very important because what it means is when the manufacturer put these sets together, they made sure that they selected two bearings with the same runout or the same tolerance. 
and they're selling this to you to ensure that in a set. And the reason for that is there are some cheaper bearing manufacturers that sell angular contact bearings as single units or single bearings. But the problem with that is then you have to order two bearings to make your set. But the problem is, is it's very unlikely that you're going to get a matte set where the tolerance matches. And doesn't that mean then it's, it's going to be a bad, well, it'll work, right? It'll actually work. It will work. That's a good point because if you think about it, one bearing is the tolerance is going to be tighter than the other. So when you preload them and they're all, all installed in the spindle, the one with the tighter tolerance is actually going to work harder. It's going to take the more of the load than the looser bearing. So that's why we don't recommend that. And we're actually in a little bit. We we're want our two bearings to act as one, right? The, that's, we're that's, pretending here, but they're, they're like a one. They're they're matched for a reason. It makes them like one. Like one spread out. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And the reason why you use two, if you notice, see, especially here, if we take a look at this example, okay, if you just use one bearing, it's only going to be able to take, uh, you know, an axial load in one direction. So that's why when you look at either like the back to back or the front to front, you'll see that the angles are opposite to each other. That way it can take yeah, the a load. Yeah, they're load. They're dividing the load. Well, it can take a load either from the right side or the left yeah. side of the bearing. See where if, it, if you were, if you had just, like let's say you use a tandem but with just one set of bearings, for one, you won't be able to put a preload on it no. because the angles are the same. So you, it's impossible to put a preload. But the other thing is, it's only going to be able to take a, uh, an axial load one direction. Oh, yeah. So very important. So, okay, so that's why you want to buy a matched pair. So our duplex pair, what they usually refer to it. Okay, the next option we want to look at. Um, oh, so let's look at our um, part number ordering form. See, if we look here, you'll notice, make sure I get it in the camera. Okay, you'll notice here bearing set arrangement. See, you'll notice you can actually order these pairs in different arrangement configurations. So we can order them as back to back, face to face, tandem, or you'll notice you can buy them in universal matching. Okay, these days you're going to notice when you search for these bearings, most of them you find are going to be universal matching. Okay, what that means is they've been great, the bearings have been ground to where you can use the bearing in any three of these configurations. See, where if you order them with just back to back, for example, you can only, they've only been, grant, the faces have only been ground for just back to back use. You can't use face to face or tandem, for example. So, but these days, you're pretty much gonna find universal matching okay. and, and that's what you want. It gives you more flexibility, you know, ensures that's gonna work with your spindle. Okay, and if we look here, it should be same here. Yeah, bearing arrangement. Uh, see here too, you can order them, you know, same thing back to back, face to face, tandem, and um, there's that four piece configuration right there with the oh, there you go, there's that, yeah. What this there's is the other half of it. <laughs> what this is telling you, this is very important. I'm glad you pointed this out. See, this is showing you that you can buy this set as a tandem, two, so you're getting two pairs for four bearings. But what this ensures is, this ensures you get four bearings of the same tolerance that we were just talking about. Because you wouldn't want to buy two duplex pairs, so they're selling you the whole set of two pairs. So she's so stable. Very, yeah, very stable. And you'll find this configuration on your much larger spindles where you need that load, you know, the load requirements. Oh, like a big vertical CNC. That's right, in your large CNC machines. Yeah. And you'll even find, guy, you'll find sometimes there'll be two, three, four, five sets in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? It's all, the thing looks like, it looks like a spindle just stocked with bearings. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> That's right. I think you noticed that at your dad's company with yeah. his large CNC machines. Yeah, they do that. Right. You saw many sets on the spindle. Oh. Yeah. Expensive. Big. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The next item we want to focus on is a tolerance class. Okay. Uh, when you look for these bearings, you're going to notice the most common 
is what they refer to as ABEC, okay? And basically, it, it starts at uh, ABC 1, 3, 5, 7, and goes, I think, up to 9. Okay, yeah. for, for all the 11 spindles, so that's for all the headstock spindles and for the 11 accessory spindle, we need ABEC 7 bearings. Okay, you can use ABEC 9, which means it's going to be a higher tolerance bearing, but you typically don't find them. They're very rare, and I imagine if you buy, if you buy them, they're going to be really expensive. But you could use them if you happen to find them. But uh, typically, you want to use ABE 7. That's the requirement. That's the 11 requirement. That's a, exactly. That's yes. 11 requirement. So that's the minimum you need to be playing with here. That's right. To obtain those tolerances. Okay. And if we look... So, if we, so we look at the part numbers for these. Let's see if we see them in here. Okay, here we go. So for the Barden part sheet, see actually uh, they show P4S, which means ABEC sevens. Um, okay, so for this particular bearing, for the size we need for the 11, they're pretty much only selling it in ABEC 7, so you can get it. So for this type of bearing, you can only get ABEC 7. Okay, the S, so, and that's, you're, you're gonna run, you're gonna run into that too. Remember, these aren't, these aren't your skateboard bearings or your motor bearings. You know, these are for precision applications, like for your spindles and, and whatnot. So that's why you're gonna find that it's not available in lower uh, accuracy bearing types or options, okay. okay. The next thing we want to look at is preload. Okay, so if we look at our pair, so in our case, you know, we're doing back to back. So when you order these bearings, you can order the preload you want you want them ground to. So that means what the factory does is the factory, they grind the side races right here to where when you, so when you install these on your spindle and we tighten the spindle nut, the way the manufacturer grinds these races is gonna give you that preload. So that means you can order a light preload, a medium preload, a heavy preload. And based on how the manufacturer grinds these races, that's a preload it's gonna give you. It used to be, going back many years ago, I don't think you could even buy bearings that were ground for a preload. They would be, you would buy the bearings and the bearings would be ground flush, but with no preload. And that's really important because you'll find if you open, if you happen to disassemble a very old leaven headstock, what you're gonna find is you're gonna you're gonna remove the bearings off the spindle, and then suddenly when you remove the two bearings, you're gonna find a shim in the center. And you're gonna wonder why why is there a shim? The reason why there's a shim is because it was probably a really old spindle where Levin couldn't purchase the, the mat set that was ground to specific preload. So, so what you would have to do is the oh, manufacturer would tell- They dropped a shim on the inner race. That's right. Cause the, I and, get and the manufacturer would tell you- In their case. They would give you the thickness of the shim you would have to use for the preload you're looking for. So they'd tell you, you need this thickness of shim for a light preload, this thickness for a medium preload and so forth. So that's why, and so if you if you disassemble your headstock or spindle and you find that shim, you don't need it. You want to toss it because <laughs> you. I, I've known somebody that thought it was really important, and they put in you know a newer bearing set that was already ground with a preload. And what they did is they really increased the preload pretty heavy, and oh, you don't want to do too, that. Too much. Yeah, too much. So, okay, so what kind of preload do we want? Let's take a look at the ordering sheets. Okay, you'll notice if we look at the Barden, okay, if we look at the Barden, make sure I have in camera again. 
Okay, you'll notice the preload, you'll notice it's available in light, medium, heavy. Okay, but on the SKF, you'll notice it's available in extra light, light, moderate, heavy. So a little more choices. Yeah, a little more choices. Man. Okay. What I tell people is you want to go with the lightest that's available for the bearing set. So for Barton, for example, their lightest would be light. Okay, for SKF, their lightest would be extra light. So if, if we we're going to use an SKF or order these bearings, I would specify extra light. And that that's applicable for, again, for all 11 spindles. So very important. And the reason why that's important is because uh, if you're happening to use like a medium or uh, heavy preload bearing, what's going to happen is there's going to be such a preload on the bearing, it's going to be more difficult to turn. Okay, again, in a very large spindle and a, or a heavy spindle, that's probably what you're looking for. You want that heavy preload because of the weight or the, just the size of the spindle. But because you know, we're talking about little tiny spindles, Man. we want the lightest preload we can buy. Okay, very important. What you're gonna notice is on your typical deep groove bearings, we're talking just your common class bearings. Okay, the bearing cage I'm referring to is that cage that you usually see in steel that's holding all the bearings apart. But you'll notice, look how this looks different. Okay, this is an older bearing, but you'll notice it has a different color, a different style. And what this is, is this is referred to as a phenolic material, or phenolic resin bearing cage. Okay, so if you look at the SKF part sheet, okay, we'll notice they actually only have it available in what they refer to as fabric reinforced phenolic resin. Now let's look at the Barden. Barden refers it to textile, which is fabric laminated phenolic resin cage. Okay, this is very important because there are cheaper angular contact bearings out there that do have steel cages or nylon cages. You don't want those type of cages. It has to be fabric reinforced phenolic. And the reason for that is because that combination has oil absorbing properties. And what I mean by that is even if you're using grease, the oil in the grease will absorb into that phenolic cage. And what that does is that assists in the lubrication of the bearings, you know, rolling in the raceway. It's great for longevity. Right, for longevity. Remember, this is very high precision. So, you know, you don't, you want everything to be really smooth at all times. So it's very important to have those qualities in your bearing cage. So always check for that. So, but as you can see, if you're buying SKF or Barden, that's what they're gonna give you as a default. They have no other options, so that's a good thing. And that's what you're gonna find. You're gonna find if you buy your bearings from a quality manufacturer, you're gonna get a quality bearing. One last thing, if we look at the SKF, we were talking about the contact angle. Okay, you'll see you can actually buy it in 15 or 25 degree contact angle. Okay, even with Barden, you'll see 15, 25. On the larger bearings or from bearings from other manufacturers, you'll see other values. There's 20 degree, up 40 degree, I think even up to 50 degree. But like I told you, for the 11 spindles, we want to stay very minimum on the angle. So if you can get the 15s, that's what you yeah. really want. 15 is what you really want. If you, if you find 25s though, we've personally used 25s. It's worked fine for this application. But don't go higher than 25. Well, that was a great educational lesson on angler contact bearings. They weren't so scary after all, huh, Patrick? Nah. See? <laughs> okay, now we tried to cover everything and really did try to make sure that we were thorough in the yeah. detail here. Huh. But yeah, I think like so. Like anything else, we might have missed something or maybe you still have a question. Yeah? Sure. I would. <laughs> I would definitely have a question. Who knows? <laughs> Just put it down in the comments below. We actually will answer it. We're actually here to help you get through this. We will help you. Yeah, definitely. You have a little more lessons for us. Okay, yeah, we have one thing left. Okay, okay, we know, you know, including us, we're all looking for a deal. 
you know, I mean, we all want to save some bucks, some money, and and it's going to relate to the, the uh, these angler contact bearings because they can be really expensive, especially new. And we're going to kind of share uh, an experience with you, because um, uh, e you know we we look we look at eBay listings like so many others for deals, and let me share with you one day uh, I saw a listing for angler contact bearings. Okay, in this case, it's from a manufacturer I wasn't never heard of. Uh, but the other thing was, what caught my eye was they're super cheap. Like 10% of what they should be? <laughs> yes. And we're talking you know, like 20, 20, 25 dollars per bearing for yeah. an angler contact bearing. You know, ABEC7s, everything. Wow. Okay, they, they were sold individually though. But I go, okay. Well, individually, that's fine. They're so cheap, $20, $25 a bearing. And by the way, I still see these bearings on eBay, but a little bit more expensive than that these days. Oh. So, but I, but these were purchased, you know, some years back. And um, it was a curiosity bone that got this going, right? That's just, right. Yeah, they, buy them and see what happens. That's right. They're so cheap. We didn't care if we couldn't use them, but it was more of a curiosity purchase, which we do once in a while if it's cheap enough. So we thought we bought them, we we, we, re, we reviewed them, and we thought we'd share it with you so you don't have to make the same mistake yeah. or purchase something out of curiosity like we did, okay? So what I wanna share with you is, here's the bearings. So I bought two of them. They aren't, this. apparently this manufacturer doesn't sell them in sets. Oh, yo. Yeah, it's cool, y'all. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> okay, uh, let me switch to the other camera so we can get a close up. So here's the two bearings. And you can see, see they're sealed individually and that's how they are purchased. I had to order two of them. First thing you'll notice, if we look at the tolerance, they don't match like I was telling you about. See, this one's a negative three plus zero. This one's a negative four plus zero. Okay, not too bad, but they should be a matte set. So this, so the tolerance should match. So this isn't a good thing. Okay, like Lance said earlier, it will work. Yeah. Yeah, so you could use them, but we wouldn't recommend it. You know, it's gonna put more, the, the one, a lot of pressure on one. Yeah, on one. One's going to take more pressure. Basically, the one with the better tolerance is going to take more pressure yeah, I don't know than if the that's other. good for the spindle long term either, really, huh? Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, we don't know, but... Okay. So, okay, so that was the first thing I noticed. And that was pretty obvious, or what I was expecting. Okay, if I open one of these, which I did already... I think that was it. That was it right there? Oh, there we go. Yeah, I thought you... Wasn't it? Or did I... Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, the first thing, let's look it over. Okay, the first thing uh, I noticed was it's not a sealed bag. Okay, you'll notice it's completely open. Okay. However, if we take, let's take, uh, oh no, those are sealed. Okay, but if I were to, uh, see if I were to open any other bearing, okay, any quality angler contact bearing you buy is gonna be airtight sealed. So that was a red flag. But we're like, okay, still, let's keep okay. going. You yeah, know. still, let's, let's keep going. Okay. Okay, I'm not gonna use these bearings. No. Okay, I, I mentioned that because I shouldn't remove it. If, you should never remove or open your bearings until you're ready to install them. Okay, the other thing is I noticed that the um, bearing cage looks different. You know, it doesn't have that color or that uh, or that texture of a phenolic, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the phenolic resin bearing cage. And so I looked it up and it's actually a nylon bearing cage. And that's a big problem because nylon doesn't have the oil absorbing qualities as- It'll ride on it, but it won't ride in it. That's, that's right. right. It's still better than a steel cage, 
but it's not going to have that oil absorbing properties which we really desire for an angler contact bearing for spindle use. So that's another red flag. You know, I don't like the bearing cage. I believe the last thing I didn't like about it, uh, let me think. Oh yeah. Well, I don't like it's metal. You notice the coloring? Yeah, I'm not sure about the, I'd have to put it in a microscope to see how the ground finishes or you know, what the material type is, who knows. Okay, but the other thing I noticed and I was really surprised was that there's no marking to indicate the run out. And that's really important. Um, yeah, let me open one of these because these are sealed you, when you open them. Oh, we're actually going to use this right now anyway. That's right. So, yeah. So as you can see, this is a brand new bearing. See, if you notice, airtight seal and oil. And definitely, like I mentioned, do not open this until you're ready to use it. Can you, as you can see right away, see how the bearing cage has that red tint to it? That's, that's one of the characteristics of that uh, phenolic resin, it has that red tint. You know, and in this case, it's definitely a fabric reinforced phenolic resin. But on any quality angular contact bearing, what you're going to have is, I hope you can see it. Let me see if I can maybe go up here. Okay. Okay, what we're going to have is both on the internal race and the external race, we're going to have markings. There's markings to indicate where the run out on these bearings are. That's very important that the manufacturer places those run out markings is because we need to match those markings on the spindle, which we're going to describe in detail a little bit later. That's a okay. fascinating lesson they're going to like. Yeah. Yeah, I hope. But see, if we take a look at this bearing and bring it up. Okay, there are no there are no markings to indicate run out anywhere. Okay, the only thing they've written by hand is a class of the bearing, but there's nothing else to indicate run out. So there's no way to match, you know, to align these properly to the spindle. So that's another red flag, and I believe that's everything. That's those, a pretty critical one, though. Yeah, those <laughs> are pretty critical, those are really right? Critical, yeah. Part one, section nine, any additional bearing requirements? Well, that was an extensive education on angular contact and deep groove bearings, and that was very thorough and we hope very helpful to others besides just me. Yeah, it was really thorough because there's a lot of options available on the angular contact bearings. There, there's a bit to be spooked about, but, yeah. but don't. But yeah, once you clearly understand all the options, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, just just listen to what yeah. he gave you for, if it's 11 requirement, just listen to what he gave you for parameters there. I think yeah. you'll be in good hands. Uh, as the title recommended, I guess uh, I should ask the question, are there any other bearings that people need to learn about here besides just what we've gone over so far? For the 11 headstocks, there are. All right. Let's take a look at the diagram again. Okay, this is the parts diagram I showed you in the last section. Okay, this is a 3C closed style headstock. Okay, if you remember, I showed you there's that angular contact match pair in the front. Okay, and then we have that deep groove bearing in the rear. But let me show you the, the other headstock. Uh, this is the other style of headstock from Levin. This is what's referred to as the open style because you can see the pull, the belt pull. Yeah, is I like that's that's one of my favorites. I actually like that guy. Yeah, it's it's the older style. Uh -huh. Yeah, and see if you'll notice, although it's a completely different style, the bearing arrangement's identical. See up in front, you've got the matte pair of angular contact bearings, and see in the rear, you have your deep groove bearing. Sure do. So that's why for all the eleven headstocks, you're going to need to order that deep groove bearing. But here, let really quickly, let me. Let's take a look at the Levin, 
the little eleven accessory spindle. Want to grab that real quick, just so I oh. can. Still has the wire attached to it, but that's fine. This is that little eleven spindle I'm referring to. You know, this is a spindle that eleven uses on their milling attachment, grinding attachment, micro drilling attachment. Pretty much, they use on a lot of things. Okay, there you go. And on their um, micro drill press. Oh yes. So, okay, look at this. See, you'll notice there's only two bearings. Okay, what they've done here is because the spindle, which I have right here, oh, let's see, it actually goes like this. See, because it's so short, it just didn't make any sense to put a matched pair of angular contact bearings in the front and your deep groove bearing in the rear. So in this case, what they did was they did away with the deep groove bearing and they just used a single matte set of angular contact bearings. But you'll notice they're separated. And see what they've done was, so this is the housing for that spindle. And what they've done is between the two bearing pairs, there's two spacers. See, you'll see there's an internal spacer for the internal race that attaches to the spindle. And then there's an external spacer for the external bearing races. See, and that one actually is press fit in the spindle housing. So see, if we look at the spindle housing, see, you'll see the spacer is press fit. Sure okay. do. And see, and then here's a spacer for the internal races. Yeah. See, and this just slides right on the spindle. And how they do this is when they make the spacers, okay, they make the spacers, then they actually grind both spacers on the surface grinder upright, and they do them both at the same time. Oh, can I bring that back for a second then? Sure. So what you're saying, let me just go with help myself here. So what you're saying is that height of that to that, that That's right. to actually, that is exactly the same length as the length of this internal one. Is that right? You are correct. I actually have a better example for you. Okay. If you can see this is pretty di uh, dirty. This is from another spindle we're rebuilding <laughs> off, off on the side. Oh gosh, more parts to <laughs> go More through. parts. Okay. What I've done was, in this case, uh, this spindle needs a lot of help. So I actually had to press this out of the housing. Okay. But this is the external spacer. Okay. It's just not... See, it's the same spacer that's inside. Okay. Okay, but it's, I just removed it from the housing. Okay, so what they do is they take, they make both of these spacers, okay, then they put them on the surface grinder, both at the same time, and they surface grind them as a pair. So it's a match set. So it ensures oh, yeah. it's a match set, exactly. So, like, if you need to replace one of these spacers, like this internal spacer, you really can't just replace... I mean, Levin will sell it to you, but you really don't want to just replace this part. You want to replace both of them at the same time um, to ensure that the tolerance is identical. Just like you're buying a matched pair of bearings, you want to ensure that these are perfectly equal. Because see, what you're doing is you're kind of faking the bearings to thinking they're together, but they're really separated by the two spacers. Okay. Does that make sense? That sure does. Okay. I just wanted to elaborate a little there to understand because that part was inside. Sure. Hey, guys, this, these are the same, they're just different diameters. That's right. So, and so you can kind of see it. See, that's for the X. This is this bearing's actually for this spindle type. So you can see, see, this is for the external race. And see, that's for the internal race. That wraps that up. That makes great sense, right? Exactly. There. And see, that goes inside there. Because when you're doing your first doing one of these for the first time, it's it, it's spooky, and to know this is going to be great knowledge for exactly. you. Exactly. And then see, you'll have an understanding now how it looks internally on this little spindle and why it, need, it doesn't need a deep groove bearing. Okay. Okay. So with that said, uh, in regards to the deep groove bearing, we're actually going to provide a link to a supplier that we use uh, because you're going to find that. Finding a high precision deep groove bearing that you're going to need for this procedure is very difficult to find. And we've tried different bearing houses and we found one bearing house that we just really like. Their pricing is really fair 
and they supply very good bearings. I see that one says made in Switzerland. Yeah, see this is this the manufacturer's IBC made in Switzerland, so very good high quality. And price wise, you know, the size does differ between the different headstocks, but roughly about a hundred one hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. But remember, we're talking about a high precision. There's bearing. a good guideline of what you can anticipate spending. Yeah. yeah that's that's nice. right. Plus yeah. minus whatever. Yeah. Plus minus yeah. depending on the size. Okay. So this is going to be the same class of bearing as your angular contact bearing set. Okay. So this is going to be an ABEC seven. Okay. The other thing you're going to notice, so unlike a regular your common deep groove bearing, this also doesn't have a steel cage. This also has a fabric reinforced phenolic resin cage. So very important. See, it has your ball bearings. See. So, yeah, very important to get this same type of quality bearing. Um, and I think that's about it. But we'll provide a link to the supplier because this we've been using this type, this from this manufacturer for many years and we've never had a problem with it. And, um, and it's good enough for us, it should be good enough for you. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I think that's it. And yeah, and just to reiterate, uh, every leavened headstock needs this deep groove bearing. Just the exception of the leaven accessory spindle. In high quality. Yeah, in high quality. Okay, so again, we're going to provide a link to the bearing house where you can buy these. Because we're really happy with this manufacturer. And I, we feel the bearing house, they have pretty good pricing. And even if you want to price their angler contact bearing sets, uh, for brand new sets from the bearing house, they're pretty reasonable as well. So if you don't want to buy on an auction site, oh, yeah, you know, no. if you want to be more safe, and we do that once in a while, you know, you can't always find the bearing models you're looking for on eBay, for example. Or maybe just not comfortable with that seller or whatever. Yeah. It's just, oh, just not worth the risk. Yeah, because you know, too high, I'll whatever. tell you, there was another incident uh, that we ran into with eBay on buying bearings. Uh, you know, when you buy angler contact bearings, you know, I, I mentioned, they got to be sealed from the factory and you do not want to open them until you're ready to install them. Okay. But there are people that for some reason they open them up and for whatever reason, maybe they find out it's not the correct bearing for their spindle. So what they do is they pop it back in the box and they put it on eBay. And I um, mean, that's happened to us. You know, I'm very careful if I buy you, or if I buy, you know, new bearings off eBay, I make sure that they're, they're both sealed boxes that have never been oh, yes. opened. That's critical. But even confirming that, a seller showed one thing and said one thing, but I got the mat set and one had already been opened. What a surprise. Yeah, what a surprise. I had to return it. But so And don't accept it. If that happens to you, don't accept it. Return it. So make sure you if uh, they have a return policy where you can return them. That's good, yeah. You know, just in case that happens. Okay, I think that's it. Part 1, Section 10, Leaven Spindle Replacement Parts. Patrick? Yeah, before we continue, I just want to reiterate that for replacement parts for all these spindles, you know, you can still get most of these parts from Leaven. And um, they may not have all the parts, especially like for the open style headstocks because it's such an old product. Sure. They may not have all the replacement parts, but they still have many, like the spindles and so forth. Yeah, we did just buy a whole bunch of parts for these spindles. So. That's right. Yeah, so for the main parts or components, definitely give Levin a call. That's great. More than likely you can buy them. Okay. So what we want to discuss is, you know, one of the common things we see when people... Uh, rebuild 11 headstock is they don't do two things and that's what we're going to share with you okay the first thing we want to bring up are what's called felt rings okay every every 11 spindle with an exception uses a felt ring and we're going to get we'll go into it in more detail okay the felt rings i'm referring to they look like this obviously different sizes but it actually looks like a really thin washer. See, just like that. This goes into a little dirty. Gives you a good idea. And then let me show you, like, I believe this is a bearing cap for the open style headstock. Okay, so we have a bearing. I think this is the front bearing cap. Oh, that has this felt in it right now. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to show you. So this is how it looks. So you can see the felt ring that's in there. And then there's a little cover. 
Okay, and let me show you how that looks. See the cover, again, just looks like a washer and it's press fit. So, and we're gonna show you, there's actually um, a couple of methods or tools that we use to remove these. So we'll show you that in another section. So basically what you need to do is basically need to pop these rings out and then you'll find this felt ring, you know, sitting right in inside the groove. And again, they're going to be different sizes based on the spindle you're rebuilding. So that's how they look like and that's how you remove them. So that's so, an accessory spindle. Yeah, this is an accessory spindle. Okay, that's why I quickly just go over uh, the different spindle types so you can understand how many felt rings and where they're located on these spindles. So on this accessory spindle, there's only two at each end. There's a felt ring in the front of the spindle and in the rear. And in both cases, they're both on the bearing caps, end caps. Okay. Now if we look at the older open style headstock, this headstock style actually uses four felt rings. Can I just share right here though? Yeah. So this is the belt pulley. Right. See, just so everybody understands the bearing, bearings, and the felt pole and the and the open pulley where the belt goes through. Yeah, and that's why they call this an open style headstock because the, the pull is exposed, you know, it's like nothing's closed. It's not a closed system except for the bearings, obviously. And see that's why there's in this case, in this style of headstock, there's actually four felt rings because of the open style. Because what you do, what you have is you have two felt rings, one at each end of the spindle on the bearing caps, and then you also have them on the internal rings. Okay, and this is what the internal ring looks like. And these are actually press fit. See where these, see this is like... Threaded, yeah. Yeah, this is a threaded bearing cap, and that's how the rear one looks a, a little different, but it, they're both uh, screw on, okay? But on the internal ones, they're press fit and they look like this. But see, same thing, you'll see the felt ring. You'll see the felt ring on the inside and then the metal ring keeping it in place. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's there's actually a, three pieces here. Yeah, so three pieces. You got the, the outer ring, the felt ring, and the other ring that's keeping the felt like ring. Like a little retainer play. ring. Yeah, a little press fit retainer ring. It's that's nice. a good name, right? So, so you've got four felt rings in there. Well, on the now we're back to the closed style headstock, and surprisingly, there are zero felt rings. We don't have any felt rings on this headstock. We don't have them on the outside, and because it's a closed system, you know we don't have any internal felt. They just did away with them. Yeah, they just did away with them. And for the rear, I'm thinking they did away with it because. You don't see it here, but okay, this is the belt pulley right here. And there's actually a housing, like a cover that get fastened on the rear. So, so it's a sealed, so it's, it's really a sealed closed system. Yeah, it's a closed with a system. belt going through it. Right, and see, even the, the belt pulley, it sits super close to the bearing. So there's like not much room for dirt or debris to get in. So it's very close, so I guess. Yeah, so that's why they didn't use the felt. And for the front, yeah, let me show you. This is actually the bearing cap for the front for the 3C headstock. And if you're disassembling one of these closed style headstocks, you're probably going to notice that there's a slot in it. And you're probably going to think, wow, I'm missing the felt ring to this headstock. Actually, you aren't. It's kind of, it's quite funny. I think at one time they probably thought about doing it, but I have contacted Levin and have confirmed with Levin that on their closed style headstocks, they have never used a felt ring on this headstock. On all, well, they on, just left the groove in there anyway. <laughs> they just left the groove in there anyway, exactly. So that's really interesting. And we have our assumptions why we think Levin felt that they didn't need a felt ring. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel the felt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and why do we think uh, that a felt ring wasn't needed? Well, 
well, here's what here's what I figured out. You know, I, I taking these apart and having to, all these spindles apart and having to get all each each and every part inspected and polished, cleaned and finished. I come across this funny part in all of them. And, yeah. And it's and, and I looked at the part list and I saw, oh, what's a slinger? I've never heard of a slinger in all my days, and I've been around a while. Yeah, this so is Patrick, actually. So Patrick, you want to teach people what a slinger does? Sure. Yeah, this is actually quite funny because, you know, prior to rebuilding these 11 headstocks, we both had no idea what a slinger was. No, they've never never seen them in any other kind of spindle. Yeah, never seen them. So I thought, you know, maybe you guys have seen them in other spindles. We'd be really curious from other manufacturers. Okay, but, okay, what a slinger does? Okay, so normally, okay, this is a 3C headstock spindle quite large because of the three stick collet that's our biggest spindle yeah, that's the biggest spindle we all have for 11. okay and this is the bearing cap okay that rides about right there so that's why we would think that you would have a felt ring here just kind of riding on yeah, that spindle like, nose exactly just like the other spindles but no it doesn't the slinger actually fits it's a press fit really light and slips on just like that. Okay, so remember, this is let's say this is installed right behind it. Okay, then you have a slinger cover. Let's see, make sure I get in picture. See that cover just like that. See, and then this. See, whoops. See, fits and this is yeah. This fits together just like this. See, and that's at the end of the spindle. But there's a neat something going on in that little ring in there. Yeah. Okay. The slinger, the slinger slings something. So this is how it works. So if there's any dirt or debris or grit that gets through here and hits the slinger, remember this spindle is moving very fast. And what happens is because of the centrifugal force of the slinger, if a piece of dirt or whatever, as soon as it touches the slinger, it's, it gets it slings off it's of get it. Slung off to the sides of this. Right. And remember, the slinger is riding inside this cavity, so that little piece of dirt or whatnot slings off, hits, you know, onto the side of this. And over time. And over time, drops down this little slot. So when you install this, you know, I've actually seen these installed incorrectly. You know, you, you want to install these with this little slot downwards because you want the grav, because gravity is going to pull the... The gravity grit. is all we have here. Right, yeah. is all you have to hopefully that little piece of grit falls out. But I've seen these installed sideways up and whatnot. And so that's so, what a slinger does. But that's what a slinger does. It slings. Yeah, it slings. <laughs> it slings the little pieces of dirt and debris or whatnot that get through there. And I've never seen that before. I never knew what it was. So I thought we'd share that. Yeah, that's nice. Okay. So uh, back to the felt. Okay, so we showed you, you know, what to expect. In regards to the felt rings, you know, there's so there's two felt rings on the accessory spindle, four felt rings on the. And this is accessory spindle, just so we reiterate. Oh, there's right. two felts on here. That's okay. right. So one in the front. One just just in there, and one in, right in there. Yeah, on both of the end caps. Yep. And then on the, see here's the open style headstock. So remember, you got one on the outside inside inside outside so you got four felt rings on this headstock spindle and then lastly you know, as we showed you on all the closed style headstocks you don't have to you have no felt rings you have to deal with okay so why do we mention the felt rings because we've seen a lot of headstocks being rebuilt over the years and nobody cleans them and I think one of the reasons why they don't clean them is because it's very difficult to pop this little retaining ring out. And I guess people don't want to be bothered, you know, trying to pop this retainer ring out, pop the felt out, you know, clean the felt ring, then pop it back in and press fit the retaining ring back on. And we think that's very important. But the other thing we want to mention is you got to be extremely careful with these felt rings. This is one part that Levin no longer carries. It's been discontinued. So when you find them in your spindle, be really careful. We're gonna actually show you later. Yeah, we are. Yeah, another part, in another video part, we're gonna show you a proper way how to clean these. 
So just want to be really careful, you know, try it when, especially when you try, you It's know, a cleaning lesson. It's really, really important that you watch. It's That's right. You, or you're going to lose your felt. And especially when you pop this retainer ring out, you got to be really careful not to damage the felt ring because if we're going to clean them and reuse them. And Levin, yeah, Levin actually tells us uh, they don't, they no longer use them because they still, today, they still sell the accessory spindle. But they tell me uh, they no longer use them like if you buy an accessory spindle today, like a grinding attachment or rolling attachment, them. it's not going to have these felts. So that's really interesting. But we really feel that if they're there, it's a good protection mechanism. They've been have. good to us this far along. That's you right. see how dirty they get? They do get we dirty. Might as, and we don't use air guns. So you might as well. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some really dirty ones. We've seen some that are almost like brown, black. Yeah, boy. Yeah. So, so that's one thing. So definitely something you got to pay attention to and so in a later video we're going to show you how to remove them properly you know how to remove this retainer ring and then we're going to show you how to clean them properly the other thing we want to share with you is all the spindles the headstocks the accessory spindle they all use a collet key okay, and the collet key is there so that way when you insert a uh, collet or maybe a collet arbor, like a chuck, like a three jaw chuck, four jaw yeah. chuck that yeah. has a collet arbor, they all have a keyway. And the keyway slides in, and actually there's a key inside the spindle, so that way it slides into the keyway so the arbor or the collet doesn't. Uh, yeah, no, spin. no gouging, no spinning. Yeah, because you don't want your collet or arbor to spin. Very important. So what we recommend is, we recommend that you always replace the key. On a full rebuild. On when a you're full, in on, here, you on, might as well get it done. Right. Yeah, yeah if you're, if you're going to go through all the trouble of rebuilding this spindle, definitely contact Levin. And Levin does sell the replacement keys. And they're very inexpensive. And it's just a good, just a good practice to do because I'm going to show you something. As you notice, uh, there's no key in here. I've already popped out the old one. But I want to show you the difference between an old key and a new key. Okay, I'm going to bring it closer up. Okay, you'll see this is the, okay, so this is the old key. You can see if you compare it with a new one, you'll actually see some wear on it. See, look how thin it is compared to the new one. And then if you even look at the top, you'll notice, you know, just over the years, it's not really damaged. It's just worn, it's just worn from use. It's just time. Yeah, that's what time does. Yeah. And so so it, that, it was time for, this was time for replacement right here. Exactly. See how that has some nice thickness to it, it and the top's really nice and ground. So definitely, that's why you want to replace this. And, and the other thing I want to make sure I mention is, on all the headstock spindles, the keys are press fit. Because uh, on a lot of the headstocks from other manufacturers, especially the other watchmaker lathe manufacturers, you'll find that they're riveted. Yeah. So what they do is, they'll actually, so like this, so when you buy, when you buy a brand new key from Levin, you actually have to shorten it. So you'll have to measure. Well, here, I'm lucky I can just measure off the old one. And then you just press fit it from the inside. But um, on some manufacturers, you would insert this from the inside, as you would. And then you would file it. And then there's a whole process to yeah. rivet it, you know, with a little hammer and all that. So a lot of the spindles you remove, you know, you'll see hammer marks, file marks, and all it's that. It's almost like it's been burnished, yeah. Yeah, but I mention this because I've seen 11 headstocks, used ones, where people just assume it was riveted, and they've got all these grinding marks and hammer marks, and I just cringe because it's just a tight press fit. That's all and it that's all it is. So you just purchase a new key, uh, measure the length. If you don't have the existing key, sometimes, sometimes keys will just pop out, you know. Break uh, off. Break off. 
and or whatnot, so you can't get the length from the old key, so you just have to do your measurement of the spindle thickness, and then just slightly under. So you just shorten the length just slightly under the thickness of the spindle, and it's press fit from the inside. And obviously, very important is when you when you insert it, you, know, you want to make sure it's aligned perfectly, you know, straight. Okay. The only exception, though, is an 11 accessory spindle. It's a press fit, but uh, you'll notice that they actually they actually put in the key, and then they grind the spindle. So you'll notice that you can't really see the key because they, they ground the length with the spindle. And so this is really common. If I were to replace this, this key, obviously I wouldn't regrind this. So I, I would replace it just like I would with the headstock. Oh, okay. See, I would just measure and I will because we do have to replace some keys on our other. This is, happens to be a really almost new spindle. So that's why we aren't replacing this key. But on our other accessory spindles, we will be replacing the key. And that's how we'll do it. Right. So I just want to mention that because you definitely, for 11 spindles, do not rivet the collet key in. Part 1, Section 11, Tools Required. Well, we're going to share a little bit about tools, huh? Yeah, we are. What tools are you going to need to follow along with us? Or what are we going to use to actually rebuild spindles and have been using for some time? Yeah. All the tools you see are actually used on all the spindles we're going to do. But there's just one deviation here. And reminder, just a reminder before I get into that, we're not going to show you how each one of these tools works right now. That's coming later. That's right. Right. Yeah. We're just going to share with you which tools are used and kind of what they're for. Yeah. Just kind of that kind of approach. Right? So you kind of get used to what tools would be needed if you're following along. Yeah. So this is a little brief summary so of the, what you're going to need. Yeah. So the only difference, differentiation, differential here is we have spanner wrenches and Allen wrenches. The spanner wrenches are used on the open style headstock and on the accessory spindle, like like this one. That's right. And the Allen wrenches are used on the closed style headstocks. And that's and they don't use spanner wrenches. And that's that's the only difference here, okay? Well these only use uh, I almost forget too. This only uses a spanner wrench only on the spindle nut. And but that is it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I always forget. So we too. still get a little bit but for the most part, it's really yeah. held together with cap screws. That's right. I mean, that's what you're saying to but, me. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I think with that being said, uh, let's get started. Let's 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 get into each tool. Let's just go through them. Okay. Okay. So I think we'll start with the spanner wrenches. Um, Sounds good. That's how we started when we started doing these spindles. We used these wrenches, and in this 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 particular wrench is for the uh, uh, spindle accessory spindle. And this one's for this bearing cap. And there's what it does. Oh, yeah. It's to use to tighten it and loosen it and not hurt it. I'm going to get into details of that in about 10 minutes here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other end is different cap. Okay, another different bearing cap. No problem. Oh, yeah, because these holes are really small in this cap. Yeah, these are little pinholes, man. Okay. And uh, this one tightens and takes this one apart. Takes it off. So we'll be using this when we disassemble. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and and, uh, and then one more. There's a bigger spanner wrench here. Now this is for the op open style headstock uh, bearing cap. Okay, and see, it just holds those in there like that. You got that? That's right. Okay, and this tightens and loosens that. And that's what that's for. And that size is the same for both the rear and the front bearing caps, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, it is. It does. It uses both of them on that open style headstock. If you guys wonder, that's that's this guy right here. Sure. Okay. That's great. what this. That's what this is all about. Okay. Thank you. Because okay. I realize, I realize. That's why I'd be sure because on the accessory spindle, it's two sizes. Yeah. Right. Two different sizes. Two different whole concepts. They're really different. Okay. Okay. Then okay. Now we were fortunate. Patrick and us have a mentor named Bill, and uh, he's retired now. And, and uh, he left these tools to us. 
Yeah, really nice guy. Really nice guy who really knew how to make really nice tools. You can make these yourself, by the way, on your lathe. Yeah, if you have a big lathe, it's uh, not difficult. Or a bigger lathe than we're used to around here. That's true. <laughs> Our machine shop lathe would make this. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, this has 11 handles on it. <laughs> Yeah, and these completely replace the spanner wrenches. They do. This eliminates that. And here's what I mean. There's that nut for the open style headstock. Look at that. See that? No no spanner wrench required, no holding it tight. No adjustments, nothing. Nothing. You just take that and pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, okay. nice. And we got another one. And I see you put little eleven handles on them. Yeah, too. did you see that? There's a little <laughs> tiny one. <laughs> see? Yeah, he, he loved his 11 equipment, oh. the 11 lates and all that. Oh, yeah. And see, this one's a double-sided, so it, it, there's a little one here. It, see? Oh, yeah, okay, that, I see that. See how that goes in there and does its nut? Yeah. And then on the other side, this basically does the same. See? Oh, yeah. Okay. And that one just does this side, okay? Okay. So same thing. Dual purpose on that one, okay. Okay, then you're going to need one thing that's not on this table, obvious, for obvious reasons, is a hydraulic press, right? Okay. Okay, I can't. And you're going to need this bearing separator. Okay. This is just for removing bearings. Um, this isn't to put them on, obviously. Right. And the hydraulic press in this do take the bearings off of the spindles. So. Yeah, and we will be showing that procedure in the machine shop where we have our hydraulic press. It is the only time that we'll be out of this controlled air environment. That's right. But we'll get in. That comes along too. Okay. Okay. Now, this is a dead blow hammer. And I mean it. We can't have things bouncing all over. This is very, very small and extremely precision, and you do not need to be a caveman with it. That's um, right. And we use this to install bearings because we make these Delron, Delrin uh, uh, bearing installers. And a little lesson, just really quick, even though we're just describing here, we made this one, but this, uh, this is a, a bearing kit from SKF, bearing yeah, installation we kit. We'll, we use the SKF tool set, but if the bearing's too small, then we make our own tool. And that's kind of what we're showing you because if, obviously if you don't have the kit, you can actually make your own little tool like we did. Yeah, with Delrin. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the only lesson I want to tell you is these go on spindles, which means we're using the inner race. And when you're using the inner race, I can't have, you see the inner race, see the spindle? Yeah. See, that's what we're pressing. Uh, you don't want to be pressing this outer outer race at all you know those are, you only press outer races when you're going into a, a hole right with the bearing yeah because if you press only on the outer race you'll damage the raceways and the ball bearings in there especially when bearings are this precision that's that, right these bearings are, are scrapped the second you did that you have to stay on that center race i, I just want to emphasize it because you're going to hear that a lot in this in this series okay okay now okay and then i've got these two uh temperature meters you don't need, you only need one, and you don't need none at all, and there's two reasons for this, right? That's right. So up here on this closed headstock, closed style, uh, in, in these two sensors would sit here. Now, we're gonna, we would pick up the rear um, uh, deep groove bearing and the pair of angular contact bearings. We'd put a, a one probe here and one probe here, and we'll monitor this temperature during the, uh, what do we do there, Patrick? Oh, we do it for the break-in procedure. Break-in. You know, I get in trouble because I'm, I call it burn-in, and he yeah. gets mad at me because, <laughs> because it gets hot, so I think burn-in. And I also think electronics. Yeah, electronics. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So that's what we do. Or you could just put one on here mainly on the, over the, air, uh, the, the, the angular contact bearings, honestly. Yeah, and having two of them is just a luxury. It's just something we do because we've done a lot of yeah. them. Yeah. And we had the luxury to have these. And then or if all else fails, I'm just going to show you, you can actually use your hand, right, Patrick? That's right. And what are we what are we trying to fill for here? We we definitely want heat. Well, the rule of thumb people tell us is, yeah, you want heat, but if it's too hot to keep your hand on it, then it, then there's something wrong. Yeah, it can't be cold. There's something wrong. It can't be too hot for your hand. There's something wrong. But that happy little bear in the middle bed. <laughs> yeah, and we think it's around about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds about right. Yeah, that's about right. And I uh, guess oh no. Now there's all the tools I'm showing you that you have to have to do this job and do it correctly. But there's two tools I'm going to share with you. One, I only want you to, I'm only hoping that you'll do right by getting the right tool. And the other, I never want to see on a workbench unless you're twisting bale wire. 
This is a U.S. made Craftsman brand pair of typical pliers. Just your baseline pliers with all those beautiful big sharp grooves in there. Yeah, the serrated jaws. The That's serrated the... jaws of death. Yeah. Seen this a thousand times because we've done enough spindles to show you this. Right, Patrick? Yeah. They put it around that outside, they pop this off, they start turning it, it slips, and it just gouges this thing to death. That's how we get them. Yeah, it's very common. People don't want, for some reason, they don't have and they don't want to purchase the spanner wrenches. So they use these pliers on the bearing caps and on the, on the, the spindle nut. Yeah, the right here. Yeah. This one I see a lot. Right here. Oh, I can't get it loose. Yeah, and there it goes. Yeah, and we just hate it because it is such a common problem we see on used headstocks and spindles. You know, there's another thing that likely takes place here when you do that. We don't really ever want to squish these kind of little tool parts, okay? You start yeah. squishing these aluminum caps and you start squishing... So you start squeezing these with those pliers and squeezing this poor little nut. These aren't yeah. big, giant spindles. You're, you, that's why we make spanner wrenches and things. It's, it's made to turn this thing off without applying any inward pressure. That's a good point to make. That's right. Okay, that's that lesson. I won't even put these up on the bench. Nope. <laughs> no. They, nope. They go back to the machine shop. And the one other one that Patrick really is livid about, and these are, you know, you on the, uh, on the, the uh, closed-in headstocks primarily, you use Allen wrenches with cap screws for the covers, okay? Yeah, the socket head cap screws. And that's, here's a pair right, here's, here's, a, here's a nice one right here. This is a U.S. made hardened steel, uh, high quality, okay? Don't use any of those because they're only good one time and then after that they start stripping the tops off and spinning the, 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 the socket head of the, of, for the Allen wrench to fit in. Yeah, and that's another common problem we see. A lot of strip socket head cap screws, but worse, you know, Levin uses socket head set screws for the belt pulleys. And boy, when, you, when, they, when people strip those, those are so difficult to remove. Oh, they're a mess. Yeah. So use quality Allen uh, wrenches. I, I don't want to sound like we're lecturing here. We're just trying to shave, save you a whole bunch of time because you're just going to, you can have a pleasurable experience with all of this or you can have a nightmare. That's right. We just don't want to see people damage their spindle parts either. We want you to have fun with this because we yeah. have a lot of fun doing this. Okay. All right. Well, I've gone through a lot of tools here and now it's yeah. time to turn it over to Patrick for a much closer view of a few specialty tools that are going to require a better camera angle. So let's head over to Pat now, Shell. Okay, sure. Okay, if you remember in the prior section, I was talking about the felt washers that are in the bearing caps. Okay, and if you remember, I, was, I mentioned that we have to pop off this retainer washer so that way we can remove the felt washer so we can clean it. Okay, and what I want to show you is I want to show you a couple of tools we use to pop off this retainer ring because it can be really difficult to remove. And the first tool I want to share is a tool that anybody can buy. And I highly recommend it. It does the job really well. And this is a German brand of tool. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It's W-I-H-A Y-H-A maybe. Okay, let me show it up close. See, if you can see the part number of the tool is 26810, and it's called a chip lifter. And then let's see if I can show you. See, it's actually made, it's actually made to lift chips, like um, integrated circuits, all, you know, that are in sockets on an on a electronics PCB board. You know, so if there's a chip in a socket, it's like a little pry bar. So that's why they call it a chip lifter. But I found that it works really well in removing these. Um, especially, uh, yeah, this bearing caps for the accessory spindle. And you can see the hole is really tiny and that uses a clip. And that can be really difficult to remove. And so what I do is, I basically just, I just get, I get this little, this end, and I just kind of work its way, you know, between the retainer clip and the felt ring or the felt washer because you don't you got to be really careful you don't want to damage the felt washer because remember you can't purchase them from Levin anymore so I basically just work it very carefully to where the bottom of this is hitting the ring so I don't want to I don't want this to be on top of the felt washer pushing the ring off so I want this so I want the felt ring to be on top and the retainer ring to be on the bottom so I work its way right in and then I just 
push down and they'll just pop right off. So here, let me demonstrate it on this larger one. So, so see here, turn it around with here, let's see. <laughs> I'm working in reverse so you can see it. Okay, so basically, see, okay, I think that's a good way. So basically what I'm doing is, see I'm taking this, I'm working its way between the retainer clip and the felt washer. So I'm pushing it very carefully, again, not damaging it. And then, you know, when it's like this, I push down and it'll pop off. Okay, so really important tool because you don't want to use a screwdriver. A lot of people, they take a flathead, a, a, yeah, for a flathead, flat right. Pop. And they just go in there and pop. Like it's a they, hub gap or something. Right. And they end up damaging Absolutely. everything. Especially damaging the felt. See, because they, they put the screwdriver in, twist it, and they damage that felt ring. Where this, see, what we're doing is we're just, you know, kind of working its way and then pushing down so we aren't touching the felt ring at all. And um, the other thing I want to share, so a very helpful tool that we want to share. Okay, the other thing I just want to quickly share, another tool that our mentor made to accomplish the same task. Let me see if I can bring it up. If you notice- really sharp lips. Yeah, it has, he made really sharp rings with really sharp lips. And this is a really neat tool. So how it works is, let's see if I can, let's see this probably be better. So see, so how this works is the sharp lip, you just work its, work its way right in there between, again, the felt ring and the retainer clip. So and it has a lot more surface area coverage. That's right. So, so it's less likely to damage the uh, retainer ring. That's right. And because this lip is so skinny, it's also less likely to damage the felt ring. Beautiful. And see, and you do it, and you do it in the same manner. Uh, you know, you just work its way and then just pop. So there's another tool they can make on their, their shop blade. That's right, you could make it. The only thing though is uh, you will need to heat treat this because if you don't heat treat it, you know, because this lip is so thin, it'll just bend if you don't, oh, sure. you know, if you don't use a proper material and heat treat it. That's a good point. So that's the only thing you need to do. But another great tool. But see, we still use a chip lifter um, only on this, this small bearing cap because see we can't use this tool it's too large you know but for the other side for the accessory spindle it works fine mm, so that's great so okay so i just wanted to share that because very useful tool for this purpose part one section 12 surface plate and measuring instruments well that sounds a little bit exciting and highly technical Yes. But to see that, we're going to have to take you across the room, in the same room though, yeah. and share with you the, the, the very technical measuring tools you're going to need or be required if you were to do the job we're about to perform on spindle rebuilding. Yeah. So, should we go over and take a look at these goodies? Because I love sharing tools. Sounds great. All Let's right. go. Okay, we are over with Patrick now in the measuring area. Uh, he's going to explain what is required or needed to do a spindle rebuild as far as measurement tools go. Yes. Okay, here's a couple of our measuring instruments. And the first thing I want to point out is you're going to need a good quality surface plate. And what we currently use here is we use a steric pink granite plate, as you see. And it's, we use a small one because we're measuring small parts, but it's more than adequate for this application as well. So you don't need a large surface plate. So that's the most important thing. So we need a good foundation to start with, a good platform. Okay, the next item I want to point out is the test indicator. Okay, we use MAR. Uh, we like that brand. It's good quality, uh, good sensitivity. And because we work mostly in metric, this one's a one micron resolution test indicator. And for our Imperial users out there, that's roughly about 40 millionths of an inch resolution. So very high resolution and very critical you can't use anything less than that for this application. Um, currently it's on this magnetic test indicator stand and we aren't going to use this setup first. This is for when the spindles completed, assembled, and we've done the break-in procedure. Now we want to take a final measurement uh, 
we kind of do want we want to take a baseline measurement of the spindle before we do any grinding and then with that baseline we'll do the grinding process which is our last procedure part and then we'll take another reading to be sure we're satisfied you know with a complete build so very important and of course you know because you know the, these spindles are for use on small machines that's why we use a small little magnetic indicator stand so yeah you don't need a large one at all the next thing we want to point out is uh, you'll see a height gauge okay this is your typical height gauge at Michi Toil uh, it's a small little height gauge and you'll notice it's typical configurations with its little scribe for measuring the height and for scribing if you want but what, how we're going to use it is we're going to use it as a stand to hold our test indicator. So we're actually going to remove this scribe and then we're going to put this accessory on here that just fits perfectly in place of the scribe. And then this is going to hold our test indicator. Okay, a lot of people use this setup because, and including us, because height gauges are generally really heavy duty. And we need that really heavy duty rigid setup because again we're measuring measuring very high resolution and um and that's how we do it you're gonna have to and again this is an accessory if you purchase a height gauge or have a height gauge this is almost never included so you're gonna have to probably purchase this as an accessory but you'll find that all you do is do a search uh, for height gauge test indicator holder or, and I think we'll provide some links to where you can buy them as well. So, and then, oh, what we're going to use this for is, okay, where this measures the spindle after it's been assembled, this setups to measure the spindle part itself. So this is after we disassemble it, we clean it, immaculate. We use uh, V-blocks. Obviously for this little tiny spindle, we can't use two V-blocks. But if this was really long and you're gonna use two V-blocks, very important to use a match pair. Or this is just an example. Here's another type of V-block. And, um, and you can tell it's pretty much larger, but you can use something like this as well. I think this would work just fine. Probably not, man, probably not, because in this, in this case, we got the threads. So I'd rather not have the threads on the V-block. So this is actually a perfect fit like that. Don't you think, Blake? That looks really nice right there. Well, that's yeah. that's what I will be using. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh? Okay. So we got the test indicator. We got the stands. We got the V-blocks. A good surface plate. I think that covers about everything. Okay, fantastic. Now you know. Now you've seen the tools, and now you've seen this, and let's yeah. get into the, some other parts and things. Okay. Okay, sounds great. Part 1, Section 13, Supplies Required. Well, I thought it was a misspelling. I'm reading <laughs> this, 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 the dialogue and I realize acetone. I go, you're kidding me, right? It's my favorite thing. It is. I know. You know what? We're big advocates for that 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. Okay. And this is a good yeah, this is a good opportunity to explain why you want to use one over the other. Because it's better. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well anyway, why we use isopropyl alcohol most of the time is because it's safe. You know, especially if, if you're cleaning parts that have plastic components on it and stuff, it's very plastic safe. Paint safe. The paint safe, that's a good, a good for one. For refurbishing, yeah. Right, inks and, and stuff like that. And um but the only problem, though, is that it doesn't have the clean power as acetone. It doesn't get the bite. That's right. You do give up something. Right. Acetone is just a superior product, but that's fine. <laughs> so oh, no. and, that's, and the reason why we use 99.9% .9 isopropyl, very important, because we don't want that water content. Because let's say you get a 70%, like you get at the drugstore, even 90% isopropyl. you got to understand that the other percentage... Like let's say you buy 90% isopropyl, the other 10% is water content. So that's a lot of water, especially if you buy 70%. The acetone's 100% water free. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> and, as, and, and as all you know, 
is water is very bad for metals. I Real mean, bad. Yeah, we don't want to. We, we just don't want to contribute to any rust or corrosion. No, we got enough so. problems with it all by itself. There. Right. Okay. So. Next thing we do, speaking of corrosion and corrosion re uh, resistance, is we have oil. We a special oil we use during the assembly that's not for lubrication. Right. A for nye oil. Oh yeah, we love the world's most refined oil. You only need to use one little drop. Will spread an immense amount of of distance. I, I'm amazed. Yeah, and that's important to note is we in this application we aren't using the nye oil for lubrication purposes. We just want a thin, light coat. Film, a little film. Film on all the parts, and especially on the spindle. You want to make sure you get a good coat on the spindle because that's going to help for the installation of the bearings as well. That's a good point. But yeah, so the, so most important for the bearing installation and also once everything's assembled we don't want all any of the parts to corrode or rust because that's, right. that's a big problem we see. We, you know, we, we've disassembled a lot of spindles and we see a lot of rust and that brings me to one thing I just remembered. We see a lot of rust on the fastener threads or the threads you know, on the part itself. So like, oh, the little set screws, everything. Exactly. So like, see here, you got some threads here and even the fasteners. We find a lot of rust. So you also want to put like maybe a little drop of oil on the threads. And they'll just run right down all those threads and coat it. That's, that was it. Because we're yeah. working with coolants and other, right. other helpful little water-based lubricants that help us uh, machine. You're right. So it's always being bombarded with it. So yeah, that's a good tip. And... Uh, yeah, very important. I'll turn the next part over to you, huh? Grease? Yeah, yeah. Just a couple of uh, other items. Okay, okay. For uh, when we install the bearings, okay. When you buy precision bearings like our Angler Contact bearings and even the precision deep groove bearing, you're gonna find that it doesn't come with grease like your other common bearings that you buy for you know other purposes. Um, they just come lightly oiled, so you're gonna have to grease them. And the grease you wanna buy. Um, what we use is we use Kluber Isoflex NBU 15. Okay, and um, we're gonna you know the supplies will all have links below because that's right. right? We, yeah, you don't have to write this down don't and memorize worry about it. it. Yeah, but um, this is very important. You know, this is a highly refined grease that's made specifically for this application for precision bearing application like spindles. Oh, very good. So very important. Okay, you'll notice. This one's actually from Barden uh, Precision Bearings, the company that makes the bearings. Okay, unfortunately, they don't, for some reason, they discontinued this product. Okay, they don't make the grease. They just, uh, they would purchase it in bulk and then they would put it in these nice syringes. Really which handy. Is nice. Yeah, yeah, very handy. And the other thing was really nice is, you know, they give you a little chart. Um, and maybe what I'll do is I'll scan this chart because it's really nice. important and I'll put it on the website that's going to accompany this video or the that's video so series. Yeah, because when no I... No over greasing. Yeah, uh, this chart, is, it gives you some instructions how they want to apply the grease in the bearings. But also, uh, what's really nice, it has a little table and the table tells you the amount of grease you should be applying because... Uh, you know, unlike com, you know, other common bearings, you know, people usually pack the grease 100%. You know, they just oh. stuff the grease in the bearing. Okay, for this application, you do not want to do that. No. You will overheat your bearings. Okay, and what they call, the bearing manufacturers usually call for usually a 20 to 30% amount of grease within that cavity, okay. you know, of the bearings and the raceways and all that. So 70%, 70 to 80% is going to just be empty. Good. It'll uh, get there. Area. Right. And that's why we run the break-in procedure. The break-in procedure, you know, makes sure the grease is distributed out of the way so the balls and cage isn't running into the, you know, grease. Real good. Yeah. No no, art, no little walls. Yeah. That's right. Because remember, we're talking fine precision now, you oh. know. So, so, very, so, yeah, so we'll give you... That'll be handy. Yeah, this will be really handy. Uh, for that, and it's a really nice table. You basically look up your bearing model. And We're gonna put that in our live document. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's where all these links can be too. Right. Oh, great. Okay. Um, obviously, because this product's discontinued, you know, obviously aren't gonna be able to purchase this nope. one. Okay, but fortunately, there's another company that has taken this over. They basically purchase the grease from the manufacturer, which I believe it's made in Germany. 
either Germany or Switzerland, I'm, I can't remember, but they purchased the grease in bulk, and just like Barden used to do it, they also put in syringes. Oh, that's good. And the pricing's about the same. The pricing's, I think, it's about $35. Okay. Okay, but you absolutely need to use this type of grease, okay? Yeah. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, maybe I'll switch the camera view for this. Okay, what we have here are little grinding bits. And we actually have two sets or two sizes. And in both sets, we have two different grits. Because um, when you purchase these, you want to purchase 60 grit and 120 grit. Even though you purchase both grits, you may not need the 60 grit unless you need to take, you know, remove a lot of material. If you're lucky and your taper's still in good shape and you know, it's pretty concentric to the access of your spindle, then you just need to touch it up and you can go directly to the 120. So it's all going to be based on the baseline reading you take of the spindle taper to see how accurate it is. And the reason why we have two sizes here is because we have little tiny ones, especially for our 11 accessory spindle. So you can see it's a really tiny diameter. So we're gonna need a tiny little grinding wheel. But then for like our, especially for a 3C collet spindle, that's where we use the larger size here. Okay, and we're gonna, again, we're gonna have links to these so you know what size and, and, um, yeah, the, the diameter size and, and all the details. Okay, the next important thing is we want to talk about is when you use these, you can't use them as is. You know, you can't just put them in your little grinding attachment and then start grinding your taper. Very important is we're going to need to true the wheel and periodically dress it. You know, if it builds up with material, you want to make sure we dress it periodically and how we accomplish that is we use 11 grinding wheel truing and dressing accessory. And they actually still sell this today, brand new. Occasionally you can find them used, but very rare. So at worst case, you can still buy it new from Levin. And it's really nice. The way it works is you mount it on the lathe bed, just like you would a hand rest or a tool rest. Yeah, it has a T-slot, huh? Yeah, it has a T-slot in the bottom, you know, just like a tool rest. So you mount it and then you just run the grinding wheel across it to true it or to dress your wheel. And what it has, if we remove this little cover, see it has a little diamond tip. So pretty good. But yeah, you definitely, this is, you definitely. Very important tool for these types of wheels. That's correct. Oh yes. So very important. And obviously you'll be using these in the grinding attachment for grinding taper on the headstocks. Again, we're gonna show the details when we get to this part. Part one, section 14. The location to perform the spindle rebuild procedure. I know. I know, it, it just sounds so anal, and, and it is. It, it really is. It's dead serious that we just said a location. And why, Patrick's gonna explain it, but, but bear with us here. Uh, we really know this well, and we've been through this a lot, so when we say something, it's because it's that important. Huh? Yeah, what we wanna mention is, okay, this only applies during the assembly procedure. Okay, so when you're disassembling and all that, you can do that anywhere. You can do that in your, if you have a machine shop, in your kitchen, wherever. It doesn't matter. It's when, you, when you're ready to start part three, which is the assembling of the parts, it ha your, your, your work area has to be perfectly clean. Okay, what we highly recommend is for you to do this in a room that has a door. And there's actually two reasons for that. Okay, you want to be able to close that door because you don't want any interruptions at no. all. I mean, you want, you tell, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a workplace, put a sign, do not disturb. I mean, we, we're really stressing that you do not want to be disturbed when you're focused on Wait, assembling. Leave your cell phone at an outside location somewhere else. Either, just turn, right. the, turn the cell phone off. That's, that's right. You're only going to get one shot here, so. Yeah, I mean, remember, we're dealing with very precision parts and the bearings are really expensive. You don't get two shots at no. this. Yeah. 
Okay, the other most important thing too is we want to close that door because we don't want any drafts or anything in the air. And we're hoping that the day before I can actually get you to clean that area a little bit and let whatever dust gets kicked up in the air here and from vacuums and whatever other things. Vacuums do distribute dust, just so everybody understands. That's right. That's a good point. You know, don't vacuum your carpet and then do the spindle rebuild. No. You, know, you let that dust settle. Let it settle for about 24 hours. Yeah. Come back in. No air guns. No air hoses. That's right. No, no blow air. guns. No, no, no. None of those things. Nothing right. that kicks up any kind of environment. I mean, we're on the borderline here. And I just want to share this. We're on the borderline here of needing a face mask, little booties on your feet, and a hairnet. I mean... Almost, we're, almost, yeah. but not quite, and that's why we're taking you right down to the bare minimum that you need, but not being looking like, like ridiculous. <laughs> it's not right, that bad. Well, you know, it's happened to us, and let me yeah. share a story. See, what you need to understand is, if a little piece of lint or little hair or yeah. anything gets inside that bearing, you know, between that ball bearing and the raceway, okay, once you're done with, you're completed with the assembly, and you turn that spindle by hand. You're gonna feel that bump. Yep. And and when you when that happens to you, your your jaw is just gonna drop, and you're just gonna be so disappointed because you're gonna to have to disassemble everything yeah. and clean the bearings. And e even if, I mean, sometimes when you remove those bearings, you can't reuse them because you'd have to remove them by only applying pressure on the internal race. But sometimes that's not possible. Oh. So yeah, so you would shorten your bearing life if you were to clean the bearings and you know, so yeah, so you could kind of see, you don't get two shots at this, you only get one shot, so that's why, and you don't want to get interrupted, nah. very important. It it's a, can be a fun and really exciting experience though. Really. So don't, don't fear it. Yeah. Really. So that's why we're stressing all that, you know, especially if you're doing this for the first time, oh. you know. Oh, you know. I remember. Oh yeah. You know, so. A lot of yelling and cussing would be the understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Just is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Part 1, Section 15, Final Thoughts. It it was a lot, if you've made it this far, to comprehend. I mean, it, it was a lot of information. We've exposed you to just Part 1 before we even start doing actually anything in part two. <laughs> that's right, we haven't even done anything yet. Mm, we've just shown you what to be prepared for and we hope yeah. that's been helpful. Yeah, we tried really hard to think of everything. Oh. You know, kind of, we want to be sure we educated you on what an angular contact bearing is, you know, what to look for, you know, um, the tools required, the supplies you're gonna need. I mean, we hope we've been really thorough. And I think so. I think when yeah. we get into part two and onward, They'll start seeing things that maybe we didn't discuss, but they'll see us doing. Like That's the way right. we use this kind of towel or that kind of cotton, and then why do they do that? And those kinds. It's going to get really neat. Yeah, you're going to now see us in action. So I think we're going to head over to, we're going to start part two, and that's going to be the disassembly of our 11 accessory spindle. It's going to be neat. Yeah. All right, let's get at it.